That's good. Well, nearly there. Is, is that the, yeah, that's the first one. That's good. Okay. Um, I, I was just going to say also that um, I won't be talking, obviously, in the 20 minutes or so that we've got about the Department of Greater London Archaeology itself. But if anyone does want to read about it, thank you, my dear. <laughs> if anyone does want to read about it, um, I did write a, uh, a paper in the London Archaeologist 50th anniversary uh, uh, co uh, after the, the conference, which tr tried to set the period of the DUA and the DGLA within the context of uh, post-war archaeological development. So th there is quite a lot written there, uh, but I, I'm obviously not, not going to talk very much about the, the actual department itself, except in the context of the roads. So if we can have the next one, or I can do that. How's that? Um, that's a, 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 it's a Southwark blue plaque. It's not a, it's, it's not one of the uh, traditional blue parks. So it, it, it look, very looks like a Southwark blue plaque with Southwark English to, uh, to go with it. Um, but it's being unveiled about 15 years ago on the walls of Rose Court that uh, was the building put up above the site. Uh, and you can see in McKellen, who was very important during the period of the discovery and investigation in 1989, you can see him unveiling it. And next to him on his left, you can see Simon Hughes, then still the local MP, who also played a hugely significant part in ensuring that the Rose survived or was investigated properly and then survived the building of uh, Rose Court, as it came to be called, upon it. I was stepping forward um, a good number of years from the unveiling of the plaque. I, I was uh, surprised in 2020 uh, when uh, a picture of it uh, appeared in British Archaeology, the magazine uh, of the CBA, Council for British Archaeology, for March, April 2020. Mike Hayworth, pictured on on my left, your your right of of the uh, of of the, the arch, was was about to retire. Um, a chosen clearly to feature the rose in his final valedictory article for the magazine. Um, he had a career in archaeology of, with CBA for more than 30 years, uh, and he'd come to the conclusion that the efforts since the end of World War II to ensure that archaeological sites in the whole of Britain were protected, promoted, studied, he, he became convinced that this had not succeeded, or not succeeded very well, largely because successive governments, as he put it, uh, could argue that the public did not demand it. Uh, maybe they were not, they didn't demand it strongly enough, there weren't enough outcries to convince governments that it was in their own interest to do so. To Hayworth, uh, it was the discovery of the rose and the fight <coughs> to ensure that it was examined and saved from destruction that changed all that. And Hayworth believed that it was no coincidence that in the following year, in 1990, the government issued guidelines, so-called PPG, Policy Planning Guideline 16, which made developers uh, unambiguously responsible for ensuring that archaeological sites were either examined or protected, usually by conditions that were attached to any planning consents that were given. The issue of PP, the issue of the Guidelines in 1990, Hayward suggested, completely changed the nature of the discipline. And he thought it was a positive result for people power and an object lesson for archaeologists on the significance of ambassadors and favourable publicity. So let's go back, look back at the rose uh, a little bit more. Uh, there it is. Um, or there the site is, if you look into the distance along the, uh, along the south bank, you're looking uh, upriver uh, from east of Southwark Cathedral, and you can properly see, whoops, sorry, 
you can probably see this building here, just by just before you get to Southwark Bridge, which is crossing the Thames here. Uh, Southbridge House, it was called, a not desperately distinguished office block put up in 1957, was about to be demolished and the site was about to be developed. Uh, it was fairly well known, I think. I'll come back to him. It was fairly well known uh, that the site of the Rose Playhouse probably lay close by where this development was going to happen. It wasn't unambiguously clear. Uh, it could have been slightly further north and on the same site. Uh, it, it, it could have been slightly to the uh, west of it. But there was a chance that it had been there. I didn't think personally that if it had been there, there was much chance of it having survived. These structures, by reputation, were not, uh, not, in, not necessarily very strong. Uh, the rows only existed for a short period, probably from the late 1570s to a, around 1600 or just after. Uh, and it could well have been removed in 300 years of developments uh, that succeeded it on that particular site. But it was possible, I thought, for us to have a look, or at least it was important for us to have a look, and there was a possibility that it would survive. Now, by this time, by at this stage, the Department of Greater London Archaeology was covering 21 of the London boroughs, and it was organised and structured that sort of began with uh, planning and negotiation and went through to post-excavation and publication. And the uh, member of staff and planning and negotiation, negotiation team, uh, George Dennis, sitting there, uh, was a very, uh, a very thorough... Um, interrogator of developers. Uh, he didn't seem to know what the word no meant, especially if it was issued by a developer. And it was possible from nearly a year of negotiations with different firms who owned the site, it was possible to get them to agree to a period of investigation and provide the resources for it, more or less over the builder's holiday break uh, at the end of 1988 and the beginning of 1989, at, at, that, at that, that part of the year at that time, there was often a long builder's holiday over the Christmas and New Year period. So we got about maybe about eight weeks to look at the site while the actual building was being uh, pulled down, really, above us. Quite a lot of archaeology had to be done that way then, and it was made things quite dangerous. George managed to get some time, managed to get some money, and we started an investigation. Um, there were some clues that, that it might have been on the site. That's a map, you saw another version of that map recently. Um, basically, between the globe and what was the beer garden, you can see this plot of land that's circular. That looks to have been the sort of position the rows ought to have been, and that may well have represented, sometime in the 1620s or 1630s, the place where the rose itself had stood. It, geographically, was uh, in terms of us students of Southwark archaeology, uh, it was if you set it against the way that Southwark appeared to be in, in earlier periods, uh, out in the water. Uh, the site was more or less around there, actually. Uh, we thought it was in something which was now named the Bankside Channel. So it was away from the relatively high, uh, relativity is, is the word to stress, higher land of the North and South Islands, uh, which lay above the floodplain gravels. So it was in a wet area, uh, and as I say, there may not have been uh, much of it that survived. Nothing was known structurally, physically, really, uh, archaeologically, of the theatres of the 
late Elizabethan and the Jacobean period in London. What did survive was uh, information. Uh, th that is um, a, a drawing of the Swan Theatre, which lay uh, a, a little bit further upstream and was built after the Rose was built, but it clearly demonstrates such things as galleries, uh, stages, arena floor, uh, and the area behind. Okay, the structure that would have been behind the stage. And also there was a, not a very clear picture I'm afraid, it's supposed to represent Titus Andronicus, an early Shakespeare play which was performed uh, at the Rose in the late 1580s or early 1590s. So there were drawings, uh, there was a map which m might have been in sight, and also there were a lot of papers belonging to Edward Alleyne uh, and his father-in-law, uh, Philip Henslow, the builder of the Rose, uh, an entrepreneur who I think would be quite recognisable today with his wide variety of interests, um, some of which included bull and bear baiting. So there is actually literature about the rose that survives. And that, of course, relates to Alain, who, after his acting career, founded the College of God's Gift uh, in Dulwich. Uh, and that, of course, is a school which is now Dulwich College. So it's rather different in its, its constituency than it was then. Uh, and it's one of a number of schools now which belong to the foundation. But that what they had done is preserved and archived his legacy. So it, it, it was a theatre which there was some information about, and it, I suppose it's quite a lucky thing, really, that a theatre with that information about w was the Rose, which was the one to be discovered in these investigations. There's Alain. There are pictures of Alain and his wife, Henslow's stepdaughter now. Uh, you can see them in the, in, in the Dulwich Art Gallery. And there is Marlowe, the young Marlowe, uh, the adventurous playwright of the 1570s, 15, 1580s. And there's the site again from a closer view. That is um, essentially Southbridge House, that was the site that was going to come down uh, basically early in 1981, once the excavations that we'd done were completed. Now, the excavations clearly found the rounds, and I'm showing you uh, a view taken by Andy Fulgoni, photographer that uh, the department used on the site and you can see, I think, quite clearly that there are uh, a, a, a range of elements of the theatre. You can sup in a gallery wall here, outer gallery wall there, uh, two phases of stage, one frontage here, the second frontage here, the arena floor, some sort of drip gully, extremely reflected to uh, the rainwater coming off the roof, and these features here, which are the most obvious ones, uh, and these are the piles that belong to the building of Southbridge House. And I, I was absolutely wrong, more or less as absolutely wrong as I could be. The Rose foundations, I mean, obviously it had been demolished, it would have been demolished after it went out of use, but they'd survived uh, remarkably well. The only thing that had damaged them was the building of Southbridge House some uh, decade or more before. So quite, it's also seen uh, quite clearly that there were two phases to this building, and indeed the papers that Henslow and Alain left suggest that uh, it was built in 1587, more or less rebuilt in 1992, uh, and then uh, essentially pulled down maybe about eight or ten years later. Now, time is going to be short. There's a couple of models of it there by Walter Hodges. Uh, that's the phase one. 
That is a phase two. Done at the time, more or less. And I'll just quickly just see a few of these elements. Uh, you can see gallery walls here, I think quite clearly, an outer gallery wall, inner gallery wall here. You can see the frontage of the first of the stages there. And there's the two stages more or less together. A timber drain survived uh, that went from the side of the stage out into presumably a, a drainage system and ditches just to the north there being re removed. Uh, for conservation. It survives and will be ready to use when the site is fully put uh, on display. And there's again a look at it with uh, individuals standing outside it. Finds included uh, one glorious gold ring. Uh, think of me, God willing, lost presumably somewhere uh, during uh, a, a performance, probably presumably by an audience member. Uh, hazelnuts, I won't dwell on those. Uh, basically, uh, the frontage for a gallery wall, uh, something which was then picked up by the Globe, and uh, uh, the, 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 if you ever go to the Globe and sit, sit in the galleries there, a wall based on this is what you have in front of you. But to actually do all this, what we needed, apart from very skilled archaeology, was support. And we got that from actors uh, from February uh, 1989 onwards, soon as more or less as we... Yep. Do you want me to... I'm afraid you have to draw to a close because I gather the museum actually wants us to go. Right. Well, <laughs> <laughs> well I'm sorry I didn't get terribly far. Um, but I'm, I'm really sorry. I don't no, know until, until this moment. Okay, yeah, that's fine. Can I thank you, Yes, you can. Well. Yeah, I'm sorry you didn't see all the stars. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Don't worry. Don't worry. So I want to thank the museum in Docklands for hosting this return to a live format. Uh, Imogen Grant, senior events co coordinator of the museum in Docklands, uh, for facilitating this. Uh, the museum projectionists, Marco Resurrection, Carly Navarro, Scott Parrott, Adrian Cotruta, MID Sales, events coordinator. Can somebody turn the lights up? Would be good. Uh, Bovingdon's for the catering. The Lammas Archaeology Committee, Nick Bateman, John Clark, John Cotton, Lammas on Treasurer, uh, Robin Densom, Lammas on Secretary, Karen Thomas for their support, Jane Siddell for delivering the hybrid side of the conference, coordinating the slideshows in the lunch and tea breaks, Julia Gibbs, Nick Pollard, Sue Rhodes with the Spellthorn Museum for stewarding the meeting, all of the speakers, uh, the morning and afternoon chairs, all the exhibitors, and to you, the audience, for supporting the return to a live format in such numbers. And I hope we will meet again next year. Thank you for coming. See you soon. <laughs>